Hi and welcome everyone to our Steinart livestream entitled The Clean Energy Transition. I'm Sebastian and I will guide you through this and tomorrow's live stream. And Lerato, she will elaborate on the clean energy transition and the role critical minerals play in it. You will hear about the opportunities to minimize the environmental impacts of critical minerals in mining. A very important topic for now and for future generations. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Lerato. She is the expert when it comes to sensor-based sorting in mining operations. And she is the, at Steinart, she is Steinart's Global Mining Applications Manager. Uh, so good to have you. Let me just say that. And she has over a decade of experience in minerals processing. She um, is a qualified metallurgical and a materials engineer and started off her career at Anglo-American. As I mentioned, good to have you. It's my pleasure. Wow, <laughs> thank you for that lovely introduction and hello to everyone. And we really look forward to taking you through our topics today and having a really good discussion. And we will have a talk for about 15 minutes and afterwards you have the chance to ask your questions and therefore please feel free to write your questions in the chat so whenever those questions appear write them down and we'll have a look afterwards um yeah that's what we do <laughs> so good we're actually live right now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just have to to point that out um and let me start with this question because i have to know how is it that you came into the mining industry yeah it's a uh, um for me i've i've always loved maths and science topics and problem solving and uh it was a no-brainer it had to be engineering um and after working for a couple of years in south africa i found myself in germany and work working for a company called steinert and uh they are providers of sensor-based sorting solutions as as we are and this is part of the topic that we'll be discussing today yeah Let's have a deep dive right now. So it's uh, clear that all industries have to become greener. Mm -hmm. And that is also true for the mining industry. And um, we will now hear something about mobility and the energy transition. And um, how does this affect the, the mining companies that we are mm -hmm. addressing? I think um, many of us are well aware of the um, Paris Climate Agreement, which sets to arrest uh, global or rising global temperatures. Coupled with this is the ambition to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. But it's impossible to reach these goals and these targets without considering the role that mining and mining activities and minerals processing play in it. We know that we're going to experience an uptick in mining activities and, and in mines um, based on the demand of critical resources, critical minerals or critical metals. And for this reason, mines are involved. They are involved in this transition. And this is an important thing to consider and to discuss. So we see the mining industry will grow and the time to react is definitely now. Mm -hmm. That what is what we have to point out. And what, what can we say to those in the industry that might or may shy away from changes? Let me add so far. <laughs> yes, so far. Um, it's, it's important that um, it's important that we educate industry as we move along. Innovation comes and there are changes that are required in industries, various different industries. Um, and in order to mitigate the risks that are associated with change, we think that it's important that we educate as we go along. Um, so having worked for Steinert for, for, for the last number of years, we've been involved in over 100 installations um, of, of sensor-based sorting in minerals processing and in mining. And um, we found that working closely together with customers, um, either via remote or, or directly local um, within these global operations has allowed us to understand better where the risks are and how to manage them. Yeah, listening to the customers, so important. And um, let's come back to the energy transition. Uh, what does it entail and how are critical minerals involved in it? Yeah. 
as I as I uh, mentioned, we expect um, generally the industry expects that there will be an uptake in um, in mining activities, um, and it's important to point out and with with the graphic that um, I'm, I'm, we're about to see on our screens over here, um, I think this graphic represents this the reason for the uptake quite well. So we see a comparison in terms of critical minerals, critical resources, and metals, um, comparing the requirements in electric vehicles and conventional combustion vehicles, and we see quite a stark difference difference in the need between the two. Um, so what we see in EVs or electrical vehicles on the mobility side is, is the uptake or the increase in the requirements around graphite, um, lithium, cobalt, nickel, and rare earth elements, which is quite a stark difference to conventional vehicles. And this is a good graphic representation of exactly that. So you talked about the transition from conventional, from combustion to electrical cars. And here it is definitely clear what the differences in requirements are. Mm -hmm. But what about the, the power generation? Yeah, this applies to power generation as well. So we know that globally, and again, with the help of a graphic, we know that globally, historically, there's been a strong reliance on non-renewable resources. So this includes thermal power, natural gas, and uh, nuclear. Um, and this too, um, in many parts of the world, is has transitioned and is starting to transition in other parts of the world. So we're moving over to wind energy and solar. But this comes with also a strong requirement around critical resources. And this graphic represents exactly that. Um, if we consider uh, the movement from these non-renewable resources to renewable resources, we certainly see an uptake in zinc requirements as well as um, rare earths and manganese as well. And is that all or can we point out something else? <laughs> something that many of you may have already picked up in the two graphics is the difference in the amount and the mix of resources which are required or let's call them minerals which are required. So if we consider going reflecting back on electrical vehicles, um, we need six times the amount of critical minerals mm -hmm. in electrical vehicles in compared to combustion vehicles. And if we make this comparison between offshore wind and natural gas or gas fired power stations, this amount in terms of the requirement increases to nine times. So we can certainly see that there will be an uptake. There has mm -hmm. to be an uptake. So what you're saying, we will not just need a different mix, but also uh, more of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we'll definitely be needing more. And um, this means that more rock, more earth will be moved. Um, with that, however, comes certain risks. So we have to consider that general standard minerals processing beneficiation plants utilize the, the process of crushing and liberating the material in order to get the value out of what has been removed. And this is an, a normal process. It's, a, it's an absolute necessary process. But in the process as well, water is used as a medium a medium to carry the material through the process. And um, this comes to with it environmental risks. So mm -hmm. everybody is aware of acid mine drainage, but there are also social risks involved, which we have to be cognizant of. So I totally get the environmental risk that's coming along with the uptake of mining activities. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is it with the social risk? Please explain. <laughs> it's a good question. And it's an important one that affects a lot of mines around the world. So social risks, we have to remember that mines are not isolated, um, not always isolated. Um, there are communities that surround mines and so forth. And a lot of data has shown that specifically around tailings management, tailing storage or slime dams, um, that if they are not properly built, properly maintained, there are catastrophic risks mm -hmm. evol involved with them. And this, these catastrophic risks include the loss of lives and the loss of livelihood as well. So these are social risks that are coupled together and we cannot ignore them. Yeah, and we should all be aware of ESG principles if we are not so far. Um, does this all belong together? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. ESG sums up exactly what we are discussing as well. So um, we know and we see that a lot of companies, including mining companies, are aligning their day-to-day -day activities with ESG principles. 
And as you explained, uh, the E stands for environmental, the S for social. So there's the G left. What's it with the G? <laughs> so the G stands for governance and governance in the way of targets. So these can be various different types of targets, equity, innovation, for example. And that is a very interesting one. Um, we also know, particularly around the geopolitical situation that we have, for example, here in Europe, that um, companies are trying to strengthen um, their supply chains and securing supply chains around critical resources. So these kinds of targets in the way of innovation, for example, um, their uh, investment firms and investment institutions uh, look at or starting to mandate or have also started to mandate the requirements around innovation um, as a KPI. Mm -hmm. So uh, this as a consideration into um, new mines that are coming up or into reinvestment in, in existing mines um, is something that is going to be more strongly mandated. And when you're talking about innovation, innovation targets, Steinart uh, directly jumps in my head. Mm -hmm. So how can Steinart support those uh, innovation targets? Yeah, I think this is important to point out. So in order to do this, we have to have a look at a graphic again. Um, and in this graphic, we see a simple and um, and traditional process of pre-concentration. We see a dense medium circuit with uh, three various different size fractions, coarse, medium, and, and fine. And um, in, in, in the process of dense medium separation, essentially, um, just to explain it a little bit more, is we have a, a, a dense media in the form of a powder, which is mixed with processed water or plant water to create a heavy liquid. Mm -hmm. And in doing this, we can then um, take uh, we can then separate coarse gang um, away from ore which is the valuable part and we can then process only the valuable part in the further 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 stream um, this is a very effective and simple process and very much accepted in industry which is good however we have to consider that it is very water intensive and also um, around the processing around the water reticulation system and and regaining the correct media those processes are also somewhat cumbersome and difficult um, and so we have to consider that um, there should uh, we have to consider that there can also be adverse environmental risks associated with plants that that include these kinds of, of water reticulation systems as we've discussed so appreciate uh, presenting this background. Thank you so much. Can you please explain explain a bit more precise how Steinart fits into this? Yes, um, I think it's important for us then to reflect a little bit on um, on a visual again. Um, and in this visual, we see something slightly different. So it takes the same idea and the same concept of pre-concentration but applies a portion of that dry and this is important because in this way we can reduce the intensity or the the the, yeah, the intensiveness of um of water usage in the upfront stream of or upfront process of um of a mineral minerals beneficiation plant um, so we're converting a part of the process from wet to completely dry. Um, and then we're allowing for the reduction in water usage and the benefits that that has on from there. Uh, we're still gaining the benefit um, in terms of uh, energy reduction for downstream, as DMS certainly will also do so. And we're offering a hybrid system in this instance, or we're putting a hybrid system um, in this instance, because we also identify and, and understand that there's certainly the requirements still for DMS in certain aspects. So these benefits are certainly having some tested numbers behind them. Can you share those? Yes, numbers are really important because at the end of the day, this is how we are going to evaluate the success mm. of innovations or new technologies. Um, together with our customers, we've um, calculated the benefit, for example, around um, SEC. So this is specific energy consumption um, at a reduction of around 30 percent, including um, sensor based sorting. But more impressive is the reduction in water. Um, and this number is uh, around 40% um, per cubic meter of, per ton um, of, of water that is used. So this kind of a saving is extremely important to consider when mm -hmm. looking at the overall environmental and social risks within, um, within minerals processing. So definitely impressive numbers mm -hmm. and also fantastic arguments for solutions provided by Steinart.
Yeah, I, I think that we need to consider things in a global perspective as well. So um, a number of studies have, have actually shown that uh, global energy consumption attributed to mining is somewhere between 3 and 4%. That is a large proportion. And if we consider a little bit further, other studies have had a look at the requirements from crushing and comminution circuits. This is anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of minerals processing plants. So that's a quite a large proportion. If we calculate these things back, we see that one to two percent of global energy demand in terms of global energy consumption um, in terms of, of minerals process, processing circuits is attributed to crushing and, and, and uh, comminution. This is the process of, of breaking down the material, liberating the mineral. As I said, very, very important and integral to processing. But if we could reduce that by 10 to 30 percent, this is a significant reduction and mm -hmm. a necessary reduction to consider in terms of innovative flow sheets and sounds like a highly responsible and imp impactful way of processing and as you said before there will be a significant increase mm -hmm. in increase let me point that out in mining activities mm -hmm. um, due to the coming energy transition mm -hmm. but um, how is this relevant to uh, process managers to process mm -hmm. designers I think it's important to keep in mind that process managers, particularly on site, um, are looking for effective ways to reduce costs, to improve efficiency and so forth. And it's certainly the case that sensor-based sorting can provide a simple, effective solution in this way. Process designers are also looking for innovative ways to integrate new technology um, or innovative technology into flow sheets. It has to be effective, it has to be proven, and this is the case here as well. So this is something that um, we think that needs to be taken forward and needs to, needs to be brought more into the light as to what the capabilities of sensor-based sorting are and what the benefits are at the end of the day. So when listening to you, obvious question now, how does this actually work? <laughs> yeah, um, so it's important to point out that um, there is a lot of technicality to things and it's important for us to educate around the technicalities in order for us to understand that it is really simple. There is nothing more that is required other than what is already within traditional processes. The benefits come in, in the elimination of certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll go more into detail tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, another live stream. Um, and now it's time to answer the questions from the chat uh, let's let's have a look if something popped up okay yeah we see a question here thank you what is the efficiency of sensor-based sorting in comparison to dms i think that that's a, a it's a very valid question to ask um so over time a number of studies have had a look at exactly this question um, the efficiency in comparison to throughputs, for example, the efficiency, efficient, efficiency in comparison to separation. From a separation standpoint, it is absolutely comparable. The benefit of eliminating, um, of eliminating and reducing um, the presence of coarse gang is certainly there on both. The efficiency of being able to separate very sharply between um, desirable material and, and waste is, is certainly also very much comparable. Um, the difference comes in on throughput, but even mm -hmm. then, we have made strides and generally the industry has made strides when it comes to sensor-based sorting. So we are moving to, a way, to an area where on that perspective, they're also comparable. All right. And is another question coming up. So we see these numbers are so impressive. Why does the uptake of sensor-based sorting seem not so high? That's a fair question. And I think that um, we need to recognize that Certain industries and and the minerals processing and mining industry, um, on our on, in general is um, tends to be slightly more conservative in taking on new ideas and new technologies. Nobody wants to be the first, and that's completely understandable. Um, but I do think that um, as sensor-based sorting solutions providers, we are really seeing an uptick and this movement into people wanting to be the second because they're recognizing the benefits. They're seeing that um, there is the requirement because of the transition and for, for many other reasons around, for example, targets and environmental targets as well as KPIs. So um, the uptake is certainly there. Um, and now we have two decades within the industry as 
as providers in general and as the availability of of such technology is so we're certainly seeing this trade this this change this transition for us as well all right yeah good good to hear and another question what kind of throughputs can you expect with sensor-based sorting good question um, coming from the chat <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to see that people are asking questions. So thank you very much for engaging with us. I think that this is what we wanted to have. We wanted to have this kind of engagement um, and we want to have the feedback um, and the concerns, the critic and the comments that that's that's absolutely welcome. Um, so throughputs, uh, this is largely dependent on material. So um, this is dependent on size. This is dependent on specific gravity. This is dependent sometimes on shape um, and all these aspects or cubicity as it's called. Um, the, all these aspects have um, have an effect, but generally one would say that it can be anywhere between 150 to 200 tons per hour per unit and as low as what the requirement may be. We see that in diamond final concentration circuits, we are as low as one ton an hour because we've really narrowed the stream down and we're finally concentrating and that is just what is available. So from as little as a couple of hundred kilos all the way up to 200 tons per hour and that is also improving in excess of that in certain very specific applications. We see phenomenal throughputs, like I said, comparable to DMS. Thanks for answering this good question. Is something else coming up? Yep. Okay, what is the limitation in terms of bottom size that can be processed? Yeah, good question <laughs> as well. Um, so bottom size is is really the, the 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 smallest size for which we can we can process or which is processed and and in this instance again it depends on the material. Um, but we're processing currently all the way down to three and a half millimeter size of material, um, and the, there's the potential also other companies are able to do slightly lower than that, and that just depends on the requirements. There needs to be an understanding that um, from that perspective, there's an, there's a let's say an impact on um, on throughputs. So uh, throughputs are not comparable in that way to say that a unit can run at 200 tons an hour necessarily with pr processing 3.5 or or four millimeter material. Um, that picture looks quite different. Nonetheless, instances where we, you'd need to process that kind of, of um, size material and whether you need to process that kind of size of material is also another question. So yeah, um, yeah I hope that helps. All right, so an answering a question with another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what can I see? Can I test my material is a question that I see. We strongly encourage interested parties, companies, process um, houses or plant houses to test material um, for a number of reasons. Um, one is for, for surety, for, for risk management. Um, others is to make sure that we are adapting systems well enough to fit into a process plant. So when we're talking about greenfields applications, it's a little bit more easier. We can have that working relationship with design houses, with the customer to instruct or to give ideas as to what is the best feed prep required for sensor-based sorting. Um, so that is important and part of testing gives that information. Hence, mm -hmm. testing is extremely important. And we have, lucky for us, um, a number of um, test facilities globally. We have a very impressive test facility here in Germany, um, where the R&D and development of everything globally happens here. Other than that, we have Australian test facilities. We have Latin American test facilities in, in Brazil. We have US test facilities, and that is even growing globally. So absolutely. All right, so we see there is a dialogue happening here. Uh, another question, which commodity sector has shown the largest uptake in terms of sorting? Um, interesting enough, uh, sorting is something that people think is new, but it is not. Mm. So sorting has existed um, first on the manual basis and still does in many instances, manual hand sorting, people pick material um, and people still do pick material where sorters are in place as well automatic sorters um, so sorting has been around um, for several years uh, for for several decades as well um, one of the commodities that has had undertaken sorting at the very beginning um, i would say is the diamond industry mm -hmm. um, and i think that for the most part it has a lot to do with security concerns um, and so in order to alleviate a large proportion of that uh, certainly then um, diamonds undertook that at the beginning but we've also seen instances for example on uranium where uranium sorting was implemented also in the 90s um, for health 
OHS reasons and so on. So it's not a new technology or idea. It's something that has adapted and evolved as innovation has come along. All right. So good to have you as the expert here for sensor-based sorting. And yeah, uh, when looking at the time, I can say uh, thanks for the questions um, that you wrote down in the chat um, and the rest of the questions, if there should appear something. Uh, meanwhile, we're talking here, um, mm -hmm. we will answer those via email. Mm -hmm. And also important to mention, we will be back tomorrow <laughs> with another live stream the same time and you find the access links or the access link in your last email. So that's what I have to point out. And tomorrow we will explain exactly where SBS sensor based sorting makes sense and mm -hmm. where it also doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Also important to point out at what benefits in figures result from it. So we can definitely say and highlight tomorrow is the crucial day. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining this live stream today. We see you tomorrow. And if you already know that you want to talk to Steinert about this topic, please write your, your, your inquiry and your message to mining at steinart.de and our experts will process your requests as soon as possible. Always wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and Lerato, thank you so much for your energy, for your expertise, uh, for your passion. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I think it's important that we look at this responsibly and that we have a conversation that takes the minerals processing and mining um, world forward in a responsible manner, considering the uptake that we certainly see is going to be experienced um, globally. So thank you. And we're together looking forward to tomorrow. Then we will learn about the two most effective ways of using sensor sorting. <laughs>